My name is Mike Richardson. I'm a CEO, founder, and president of publisher, producer of Dark Horse <laughs> Media, uh, which is now the, a big name for our company, Dark Horse Media, which includes Dark Horse Comics, Dark Horse Entertainment, and things from another world. Oh, okay. And I'm Robert Langston, librarian at the Lenny Library. And hi, Robert. Hi. Mike has agreed to come on to our cultural forum, which is now online, and this is the first one. It's an experiment, so let's hope it goes well. And you'll notice I've got the mural behind me. Well, if so you notice, I've got all kinds of stuff behind me. I saw that, and I was getting a little bit jealous of all the, you know. <laughs> That's oh, what I do. Some yeah. people uh, sit at bars, and I, are, and I read comics and buy toys, you know. See, I like yours better. I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of bars, but I like reading comics and I not like toys. I don't wrong with it. I owned a bar no. for 10 years. <laughs> so can't, can't complain about that either. Wow. So we're here to discuss your newest book and then whatever else information you want to share. And let me... Sure. Yeah. Oh, I love that book. <laughs> Yeah, I did too. I, I finished it yesterday. Fortunately, it was a quick read. Well, it was an attempt to take a, a Chinese legend and westernize it in a way that uh, Western audiences could uh, uh, understand and appreciate it. Oh, have you considered doing a manga version of it or are you going to leave it as is? No, actually, I aim that at younger readers. Uh, not that anybody can enjoy it. I've gotten a lot of great uh, uh, reviews for it. Uh, but uh, I am thinking very seriously of now doing a serious version uh, with a whole different uh, second and third act. Oh, okay. Would it be geared more toward teens and adults? or It would be for adults. It would be uh, more of a, uh, an adventure. Uh, an adventure. A big monster fighting adventure. So I always thought the idea of taking content and all the different ways you can uh, – spin it and I thought uh, anybody who sits down and writes graphic novels has to sit and decide where they're going to go and what the point of it is and uh, I, on this one I was torn between uh, which direction to go as I was doing this so I decided that I might uh, do a, a different version of the same story that's uh, more uh, along the lines of uh, oh maybe Game of Thrones or something. Not oh, that, okay. Not all the political, but I'm talking about with dragons and a heroine and and right. political consequences and all of that. So same story, but uh, the Nian monster is the monster that comes down every year. Uh, What's the legend in China and uh, takes someone from the village, and uh, the uh, ultimately the story goes that. Uh, uh, a magic man or some kind of uh, mystic uh, man came down and used gunpowder, gun the uh, um, red, the color red, and uh, fake dragons and uh, scared the dragon away. So that's what they do every Chinese New Year. That's why you see all the fireworks and the red and the dragons staking through the crowds. And that was uh, the legend of where that tradition came from. And I didn't realize that until I actually read the book and then all of a sudden, you know, the light bulb moment. I thought, oh, okay, when you see the, the dragon on the, on the longer sticks going through the crowds and the fireworks, now it all makes sense. It's scaring away the neon monster. <laughs> wow, you can't probably can't give away in the, in the in bigger one if the monster learns to not be afraid. You'll have to wait for the book. No, it'll be a more, uh, it'll be a more, uh, Oh, what dramatic and thrilling and scary version. Of <laughs> I can't wait. From the, when you first started writing or got the con concept, how long did it take you before you finished the writing and then the novel? I had the idea. I have a list of ideas I have. There's always about 100, and I keep adding to that list. I'll write a paragraph or a couple pages of an idea, and uh, uh, a lot of times I write them, and a lot of times... Uh, if I'm in a hurry and I can't get to it for a while, I'll give the outline to a writer and have him write it. I have uh, two books being written by uh, writers who I've given stories right now, and I've always done that. And uh, um, it's just a matter of creating content and telling stories. And our um, 
uh, that's what our company is built on. You know, we're we're in. You know, I always look at us as an IP engine that uh, <laughs> we work internally and uh, with other creators, and we create content. And some of it is really, and most of it for us is really appropriate for graphic novels, comic books. A uh, graphic novel is just a fancy name for a bad or comic book. You know, they're all. Yeah. And, I use uh, the phrase. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I was going to say, I use the, the phrase graphic novels at work because it just sounds, you know, more like something a librarian would say. Because for the longest time, especially when I started, libraries didn't have comic books. Yeah, and, I know. I'm well aware of that. <laughs> and then finally, somewhere, the, the dam burst. <laughs> the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so if you're a librarian, you call them graphic novels. But if you were a, a critic, you'd call it uh, comics lit. Oh, okay. That's a new term I have to use. Uh, yeah, that's not a new term. It's around, been around for a while. I always thought it was about uh, people were afraid to say they were reviewing comic books. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember younger, when I was really young, going to Fred Meyer's and they had this sp rack spindle and, you know, and pulling one off and oh, yeah. reading it and putting it back on. And <laughs> different day, different time, you know. Yeah. I have one of those racks in my office. Maybe you can see it over there. In the very corner. Mm -hmm. Not quite. Oh, kind of. Yes, I see it now. Hey, kids, it's comics. <laughs> Do you let the kids come in and just stand there and read comics for an hour before you chase them out? Uh, well, in my office, uh, they have, we give them their own books, not just comics, <laughs> all kinds of books, comics certainly included in them. Uh, they haven't taken too much. They they read them sometimes. Uh, they're more interested in, of course, like every kid today, in uh, electronic uh, entertainment. <laughs> and that seems to be one of the areas where comics hasn't quite made it is into like the ebook uh, venue, at least for the library. There's a few sometimes, but not as many as I think we should have. We're doing pretty well in that area. We have our own. Uh, uh, storefront for uh, digital comics. We're also at Comicology and we, we build our own apps. So we're, we're pretty much everywhere you can read a digital comic, a Dark Horse exists. And you know, in Asia, particularly in China, that's people read their comics digitally. You know, that's, that's okay. physical comics have not uh, blown up over there. It's a, a uniquely American uh, format. Uh, evolved out of newspapers. Um, there was a time when every city had uh, multiple newspapers and that's where people got their news. And uh, um, the newspaper strip is what sold those newspapers, if, believe it or not. Uh, if you had the number one comic strip, you had the number one paper. In fact, if you notice, they still do it in some places. Uh, the comic strips were so popular that on Sundays they'd wrap the paper, the comic strip would be on the outside of the right. And that was to uh, sell the newspaper. So as time went by, a couple of guys uh, got an idea to, as a promotion for Procter & Gamble, if my memory serves me, uh, to um, take those old news strips. Because in those days, you printed the comic strip and it was just gone. You know, they just went away. So uh, they, uh, a couple of guys got an idea to take those and repackage them the cheapest way they could, which was basically taking a sheet of paper, folding it a newsprint, cheapest paper there was, which newspapers are on, fold it a certain number of times where it came out to be 32 pages at a specific size, take the magazine glossy news uh, pages and slap around to keep it out <laughs> of the room and, uh, or keep it dry and then put two staples in it. And that was about the cheapest way they could do it. And it was a huge success. So they both decided to uh, get into that business. They say, hey, this would be a great business. And start with uh, publications like Famous Funnies, which was a reprint of uh, all of the comic strips in comic book, what we now call comic book. Uh, you, you might wonder why they call them funny books or comic books. Uh, and you probably never knew, right? Because they're not always no. fun. They're not uh, <laughs> comic. But the reason is they came from the comic pages and the comic strips from the newspaper or the funny okay. pages. They used to call the newspaper strips the funny pages. So these were funny books or comic books. So uh, mostly reprints. Uh, they had started to do some original work, but a failed newspaper strip was pitched to uh, 
a publisher who was going to start um, um, a new title called Action Comics. Oh. And the failed strip was Superman. And he picked it up and of course that started today the fact that you think of superheroes uh, when you think of comic books is from that that strip it's superman uh, was such a sensation at the time and uh, it's interesting to note that the creators siegel and schuster were paid a few hundred dollars and then let go <laughs> short time later and uh, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the types of things that was still going on when i started dark horse and that we uh, determined to change, where creators who brought in works became partners with publishers as opposed to uh, lost the rights to their work. And that's how the other two large uh, publishers, we won't necessarily name them, um, that's, they, they, they pay their people and then they keep control of the content and own the content? Well, uh, generally uh, for the two big companies, Marvel and DC, uh, basically they own the work you do, but they do have they do have some creator deals. Uh, I don't think it's like ours. I mean, we pay, we try to pay the best rate we can, depending on what the sales are going to be, and enter into whatever kind of deal we can work out with the creator to uh, basically license their work is what it amounts to, and then we may take that on and extend that that agreement to include films or toys or wherever it goes. Dark Horse has a film division, as you know. Right now, we have the number one um, show, one month show uh, in history for Netflix, which is called The Umbrella Academy, season two. I've been streaming uh, that. I just finished it. Yeah. And, and that's you guys? Yep, that's us. Wow, that's We're really cool. At, uh, Universal and with um, Netflix. Okay. And, uh, that was conceived of by Gerard Way, who was the front man from My Chemical Romance, uh, the group MCR. And the, he had called the office and he had ambitions to write comics. And I finally got together with him and he pitched the idea and he threw ideas at me that were completely <laughs> original. I mean, uh, the Eiffel Tower is a sleeper robot created <laughs> to destroy Paris. So, uh, you know, it was just a lot of fun. And if you watch the series, you just see how uh, original and fun, and it's not a traditional superhero uh, piece right. at all. Uh, they brought something new. And, and then I think as fantastic as it is, more grounded in the uh, inner turmoil of a family, which is what they are, a dysfunctional family. Well, yeah, Klaus is an is a alcoholic and drug addict and, and isn't really interested in saving anyone. And, well, he's the where he is is because, of course, since he's been a kid, he's been looking at dead people. <laughs> you know, and I, I guess that uh, pretty much would uh, mess anybody up, you know? Yeah. So, you know, so uh, Gerard still owns the work, but we're partners with him, and we continue to work with him. And Gabriel Ba is the artist that helped design the characters. Both of them also, we brought them with us when we started the show, and they both work on the show also. And contribute and so that's our that's a good model mike mignola who does hellboy is a great model who has yeah. done, opened up created a whole universe and on top of that you know we've we've done the movies together uh we've done three uh, feature films with mike's work and uh, two feature animated uh, films that, that okay. not really realizes with the original hellboy cast so uh, it's been quite a uh, media phenomenon is there going to be a season three of Umbrella Academy? We have no official word yet, but we assume. Okay. It's like I say, for uh, the month of August, I believe, it, it charted higher than any uh, uh, Netflix show in history. And also the Nielsen uh, ratings you're aware of finally did a streaming Nielsen rating, or oh, ratings. Oh, up. Umbrella Academy was number one on that also. By oh. what wide margin, by the way. That's... Some good numbers. It would be weird if they didn't yeah. re-up it. And, you know, Umbrella Academy is one. We have Resident Alien that's uh, appearing soon on USA Network with Alan Tudyk, and it's an amazing show. It's so much fun. I, I can't wait for people to see it. Um, we've got a, a number of projects coming. We have Coyote coming on CBS All Access. I believe that's where it's premiering, and it's uh, we did it with uh, Paramount and Sony, and um, it's... Uh, 
starring uh, Michael Chiklis and uh, a whole different type of thing, a drama uh, down on the border. And uh, uh, so we, we have a number of projects going, some that are about to start shooting in. Uh, virtually 90% of our films and series have come from the comics, originated as comics. Then made it to the film. Have you had any that started as a film, then went to went the opposite way from film to comic? Oh, well, we do that all the time, not necessarily from us, but I mean, yeah. Star Wars, Aliens, Predator, Terminator, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, all started out as movies that we then went and talked to the creators or the studio and, and turned them into a successful comic series. So uh, we still look, right now we're doing Witcher, which uh, started out as a video game, now is a successful a series on uh, Netflix and we work with the creators to uh, turn it into a comic series and some amazing uh, uh, collectibles and uh, uh, um, Stranger Things is another one um, Last Airbender. I mean, these are all big projects that uh, we've taken from film and then trans translated into uh, comics plants versus zombies the video game. <laughs> sold millions of copies of plants versus zombies. So you guys are involved in Stranger Things also? We're at publishing side of things, yes. Oh, the publishing side of things, okay. Because that's a, that was, you know, that's been a favorite show around the home. Oh yeah, we all too. love it. <laughs> well, so we look for the things we like and then we, uh, you know, as uh, pop culture fans, we try to find the things we like and then find out how to uh, uh, translate them into other, other formats. So when I, I noticed when reading is is it Gia Nian? Is that how it's pronounced? Did I do okay on that? Gia Nian? Oh. Gia and the Nian Gia. monster. Yeah, it's, Gia. it's pronounced, pronounced not, quite, not quite how it's spelled. It's pronounced a little differently in China, but Gia, uh, Gia and uh, the Neon monster. It says... I, it's, but everybody says Gia and the Neon monster. That's <laughs> It says it's a script, so is this going to be turned into something else rather than? We or what did you know. say? We, we, you never know. I mean, we've partnered with uh, a company in China and uh, entertainment company, and uh, one of our goals is to create entertainment. So it's one of the reasons that uh, we've we've done some uh, uh, or are embarking on doing some uh, uh, taking some of the Chinese legends and turning them into sort of westernize them a bit, so they're. Uh, Relatable on both sides, east, east and west. <laughs> if someone wanted to be a um, a writer or an illustrator, what what should they be doing to prepare themselves? Write and illustrate. <laughs> uh, that's it. So, how people want to want to be an artist? If you'd like to be an artist, you should carry your sketch pad around and learn how to draw. Don't learn how to draw from comic books. Uh, learn how to learn how a car looks and how perspective works. Uh, um, learn how a building looks in the background. Uh, if you don't know perspective, it's not going to come off right. And uh, so learn those basics. The perspective's a tough one. I had a tough time with it, and uh, but it's uh, it's it can be learned. And then once you know it, uh, you can you can play with it. Once you understand, it's just like the human body. You should understand uh, what makes up a human body, the anatomy. Uh, Jack Kirby invented muscles that didn't exist. No. <laughs> that didn't exist, but because he knew how to draw people, he could do it in a way that worked and looks fantastic. You know. Yeah, I remember when you you came you came to the cultural forum in 2013, and I remember two things from that. One, you told everyone who brought up a drawing learn perspective. Yep. And number two was you talked and, and looked at every single person's drawings when they came up and you stayed for like an hour, hour and a half afterwards doing that. And that was really phenomenal. I was really impressed I like by that. that. I like to give encouragement to, uh, um, to potential artists. And you know, some of them you can see may not have the spark that does it. You never know where they can do with it. They might go in a different form of it. Some are naturals and some can get to be very good by work, hard work, you know, and, uh, you know, there's those people who look at art and say, we'll tell them, you know, to go somewhere else. I'm not that person. If you want to, if you love to draw, you should draw and you should find a way 
and a style and something that uh, you can succeed in. And it, it's always going to be hard work. Artists don't have an easy path. Uh, comic book artists, you know, you have to get work. So you have to know your trade. And so you give them the, the best guidance you can. And, and the number one thing is, uh, you probably heard me say a number of times, carry your sketch pad around. I used to carry mine around and, uh, you know, I, I, I did a lot of other things too. And uh, um, if I had to do it over, I'd probably start early and focus more on the art than the other things. But uh, I, get, I get a lot of satisfaction out of writing stories too. Do you wish you had more time to write? Because I mean, you run a huge enterprise, so that must take up a lot of your time. Yeah, my graphic novels are never as good as I could if I could spend a month just <laughs> working on those, but I, I do them in my spare time and on airplanes and in between meetings. So, uh, but I've done pretty good. Uh, I've gotten some good reviews over the years. Some of my characters have uh, hit the big screen. The mask was a, was a character I used to draw in uh, something called APA 5. Uh, which is, I think, stands for Amateur Press Alliance, where if you're an artist or a writer, this before the internet, uh, if you're an artist or writer, you uh, contribute your, your material to a magazine. They never had more than 50 members at a time, if I remember, and, <laughs> and a waiting list to get on when somebody would leave. But mm -hmm. Frank Miller was a member of Apple 5, for instance, and Paul Chadwick, and... Uh, Randy Emberlin and Randy Stradley and Chris Warner and uh, dozens of, Mark Verheiden started it, who's now a, a, a big time uh, film and series writer. I've, I've done a couple of films with him myself. And uh, he started it and it was for comics. It's a comics app. And so you'd write and you'd draw and then you'd get savaged by the other 49 members. So <laughs> helped, helped, uh, helped you build some uh, thick skin uh, throughout, through it all. And uh, it was a good exercise. That's what, that's where uh, Dark Horse, I, I took who I thought were the best people. Uh, Randy was a writer, Randy Stradley. So I told him I was going to start a comic book company. So he came and quit his job. And we got a couple other uh, people. Uh, Paul Chadwick did a, a series called Concrete for us, which was huge award winning book. We've got, we got, uh, and Paul won Best Artist a number of times and so many things. He came out of APA 5. Uh, we got uh, uh, Mark Verheiden, who wrote uh, a, a, a series called The American. Got Chris Warner, who created Barbed Wire. And that was back in APA 5, uh, Barbed Wire. Uh, and, uh, oh, who else? Randy Emberlin, who was a Marvel inker for years and an artist himself. Uh, we just got a number, Mark Badger, who, who I took the first, uh, uh, was the first person I hired to, to uh, uh, do a mask stories. And he did his own version of it for, for uh, a few issues. So all of these people that we started Dark Horse with all were amateurs who wanted to do comics that when I started the company, I, I picked the best of them and off we went. We hope to sell 10,000 copies of that issue and we sold 50,000. So, when someone just draws the mask, does that, does it bother you or does it make you kind of look like, oh, that's a little different than I envisioned it? Uh, not really because my original drawings of the mask were a little different and uh, Mark came in and sort of took them and made, um, gave it his own look. And when we, started a comic called Mayhem. I uh, asked Chris Warner uh, to take uh, my original drawing and uh, redo it. And he did. And that sort of became the new look of the mask. And then uh, John Arcudi and, and uh, Doug Monkey did the, uh, uh, the most important series for the mask uh, that they did for several years. They did several series. And clearly, they took it well beyond anyone else including myself and they sort of use that but Doug was an amazing artist is a, an amazing artist and John's an incredible writer and, and they did some amazing stories and no I was excited about it you know oh, good. that they took the idea and uh, uh, went so far with it but yeah in the end it was my character and 
still is my character and it's that dark horse and, uh, we're you know we have hopes of uh, reviving the character now in film also well when you you were running a bookstore in the bend right is that our comic store in the bend when you first before you started dark horse Did I well i had planned to uh i had planned to go into my own business i've been working for a furniture company designing boxes and doing instruction sheets and I, I ended up being able to design some product and uh, 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 do the work for their convention booth space design it and signage and all those kinds of things and my wife sent me a uh, uh, teddy bear with balloons and said you're a dad and I did what any new father would do with no money in the bank I walked in and quit right there <laughs> Because I, I knew my, my real goal was to start my own business. So I was a basketball bum in those days. I was playing for uh, an AAU team here in town called Claudia's. We used to travel all over and play colleges and so on. A lot of ex-NBA players played with us. And I was also on about four or five other teams, depending on what night it was and who was playing. So I had sort of a list. If they weren't playing, I'd play for them. If they weren't playing, I'd play for them. So I was working for this other company and uh, playing basketball and then um, she sent me that. So I wanted to get away from the basketball, away from everything. And so we, I told her to, uh, hey, I just quit my job today. You need to quit yours. We're gonna move to Oregon and take the baby down there. And she said, great. And so off we went as soon as the baby. I went down ahead of time in 79 and found a space and found us a place to live. and started it out and we had zero money. I, uh, Carrie, uh, my wife, uh, was able to give me a credit card because I had no credit. And uh, I, had, I had only been out of school a short time then. And uh, so we hadn't really saved any money. But uh, I found a 400 square foot space that the guy uh, thought I was out of my mind that rented it to me. Uh, I started the store, and the interesting thing about the store is I tried to make it a store that I liked with the things I liked in it. I had comic books and games and uh, a lot of art, a lot of science fiction and fantasy art, and every science fiction book in print at the time. There was, wow. a, there was a company called F&SF out in New York that kept every science fiction novel in print there, and I'd go down the rack and order them all. And the reason I was able to do that is my wife got me a credit card. It was all on a credit card. <laughs> yeah. And so we, uh, every day was better than the last day. Every week was better than the last week. Uh, every month better than the last month. And uh, the most interesting thing is uh, uh, we didn't get that many kids in there. We got kids, but we got a lot of adults, a lot of people like myself, doctors, lawyers, who would come in and drop hundreds of dollars when they came in. And uh, it just sort of uh, reinforced the idea that there are people who like this. It's escapist stuff and fun stuff and hobby stuff, but it's something that people uh, learn when they're kids, learn to love when they're kids, and they, they're either gonna like it or they're not gonna like it. And if they do really like it as kids, a lot of them carry it all the way into adulthood. So you you get very successful people that spend a lot of money to uh, keep that as their hobby. I've noticed that, that things from another world, does that kind of mimic your first store? Because I know they have books, they have comic books, they also have games and figures. So is that kind of, you think, it, common for the industry? Or is that something you just brought forward from your first store? I did it from the first store. It was all, I used to call, because I wanted stuff that was, fantasy based. I want it to be a special kind of a store. So we had the comic books, we had the science fiction and fantasy. I'd heard about this thing called Dungeons and Dragons. I can't remember <laughs> where I heard because nobody really knew much about it. I used to call Gary Gyax, who was the creator of it. And I'd say, I need some, uh, I need some copies of the game. And he said, okay, I'll mimeograph them tonight. And you'd get these nice. craft instruction sets in a like a plastic baggie and uh, dice with some dice. And then we started selling the dice, which was a huge thing. And we started to expand to other related kind of fantasy games because when Dungeons and Dragons hit the market, the first time I saw it in a store, it was at a store called G.I. Joe's, which is out of business. You know? 
and I saw a huge uh, Dungeon and Dragon display. And that's the first time I ever saw it in a store. Oh. And I'm very good. I and G.I. Joe's, which was more of a sports store than a... Well, they had sort of evolved from that, but and down in Ben, that's what they had, that's where it was. Mm -hmm. And there was a big like bin of Dungeons and Dragons. And I don't know how it got there or why it was there. <laughs> there it was. And so we started doing lessons, giving people lessons. We got, not me, uh, we got players that would come in and after hours, uh, bring a bunch of people so we could sell them all the uh, assorted updates and dice and all of that. And uh, yeah, uh, at one point I kept opening stores until we had, well, at one point we had 12 stores in three states. Oh. And then we opened, uh, uh, then we uh, started the online store, which outgrossed all the brick and mortars almost immediately. So we stopped, the neighborhood stores sort of went away uh, because, uh, you know, the, uh, what had been lifeblood to the company at one time was now um, better, larger locations or focus our, we didn't have enough money to do everything. So we decided to put our focus on the uh, uh, online store, which is where I'm, we I hope you keep the Milwaukee one because, you know, it's just walking oh, yeah. distance from here. And I like, well, I used to like to go down there and, and pick out my graphic novels. Now I order them and go in and pick them up real fast before I can. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, the, we're, we're not going out of retail. Uh, in fact, we were thinking of uh, in the early stages of planning a dark horse store in down, downtown Portland. Uh, big, uh, you know, certainly not as well financed, but uh, our version of the Nike store for dark horse <laughs> with all the games and all the toys and all the books and the videos of all the movies and all of that and lots of fun stuff, statues and of our characters and stuff, but that's probably not going to happen now. <laughs> not for a while. And just for the record, I still have my 20 sided dice from 40 years ago. So, <laughs> and I know exactly where they are. <laughs> uh, the more sides they put on those dice, I couldn't believe. <laughs> I stopped and, and at 20. They went well, yeah, they went well beyond 20. Oh, <laughs> uh, hold on. I've got, I've got questions here and I'm just, are you going to do other books based on folklore? I mean, do you have the idea of doing that or is that yeah, just you know, part I, of your I did, hundreds of ages? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I did one, uh, 47 Ronin, before this one a couple of years ago. And actually it was, uh, well, it was put on the must, oh, which the, the big list, National Library Association, must read for teens list, mm -hmm. which I did, actually did it with uh, Kazuo Kuike, who created Lone Wolf and Cub and I had him as my editor who oversaw um, the story to make sure I didn't uh, didn't uh, misrepresent the idea of, uh, of uh, the 47 Ronin and what they stood for. And, you know, there were elements, the Bushido Code, Bushido Code was a, a big part of it. And, but there, and there's arguments about what that means and uh, the, the, uh, the story isn't exactly that. I invented some characters for to put this to get across certain ideas in the story, but the story is basically based on a real story. And uh, I always thought that it showed a level of honor and commitment. You know, uh, the fact that uh, Asano had to be revenged. It was his honor. He. He had to be honored, and these people, once they um, avenged him, went willingly to their deaths as a result. And I thought that was uh, quite a sacrifice for honor, you know. So I uh, tried to get a lot of that into the story, and particularly from the story of the 48th Ronin, as, as he's sometimes called, who I used him to package the story because there was a road and I've been to the graveyard in, in uh, Japan where the 47 Ronin are buried. And there's, a, there's the tale of the extra Ronin who, came, who insulted um, one of the 47, spit on him because he was such a disgrace because they allowed themselves to be debased while they were pretending that they had given up the life of the samurai. And when he found out why they were doing it, he went to their graves and committed seppuku. 
at the gravesite. So uh, I used him sort of to package to tell the story before he committed that act. So there's a lot of history and there's a lot of the movie stuff in it. I mean, there's, there's uh, a play that was done right after the event, uh, which caught the Japanese attention. And there's been countless movies done. And, you know, look, I, I put the story together, my story together. I, I, it always drives me crazy because at the, I say very clearly, it's the legend of the 47 Ronin. And then, you know, you'll always get somebody who said, Asano didn't go to this day, he went this day, or, you know, whatever I'm saying. But one of the reasons I got it out there is because there is a movie, The 47 Ronin, which I guess is the fine, a fine technical piece, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> but there were not dragons or witches or magic in the original right. story. And if uh, Gaijin had landed in Japan during that time, he would have been pushed back to sea or beheaded or made a slave. He wouldn't have been the leader of uh, samurai, you know. So Keanu, who I love, I, I met Keanu, I had a project with him. He's a great guy, great actor, but I, could, I couldn't take that story. So I had to hurry up and get my version. Years out. <laughs> Actually based on the real event, you know. Do you have a top, do you, do you have a, a favorite of your books that you've written? Uh, I like them all. I, I mean, they're all, story ideas that you work hard on. I mean, Father's Day is one about a father and daughter, two extreme circumstances, uh, um, reuniting. He, he was a hitman for a mob family who turned his back on her, went into hiding in order to protect his daughter. And 20 years later, when his wife dies, she tracks him down and now they're after the two of them. And while they're on the run, they learn to uh, go through, they go through all the stages that a father and daughter might have gone through over a lifetime. And uh, it, he's become a pacifist in those 20 years. <laughs> Her not so much. So it's, I thought it was a fun book. I, I like Echoes a lot. It's a story of someone we all think about well, if we could go back. It's about a, a story about a boy who watched his mother be abused and ultimately murdered. And through a strange, weird uh, um, weather event is put back, put backwards in time and gets the chance to go back and um, save his mother. That's what he's gonna do. He ends up back when he can go protect her from this guy. And uh, when he has the chance to kill the guy in the diner where she works, he sees himself and then decides, pauses, and decides to mentor himself and take himself to go do the things he never got to do. So if that's a twister, and in, in, yeah. the, in the end he, uh, in the end he uh, gets to save his mother. But it's a twisty thing because when you mess with time, <laughs> there's a great there's a great scene that I liked writing where he sits with a an old mechanic and they talk about things that we can't explain and you can't always exp there's things we just can't ever explain why they happened or when they happened but we just have to accept them and, and try to make the best out of whatever's there you know? so you know those little moments when you can find to put in a book i think is for me that's satisfying well, and, and speaking of the time, you we saw that in Umbrella Academy when they went back and still were messing things up because, you know. Well, anything with time travel, I, I love. And so that's our, that's Gerard. That, I mean, they're, they're, uh, this is his imagination and Gabriel. And, uh, you know, uh, a, a project that I wrote years ago with uh, Mark Verheiden, my friend Mark Verheiden, I told you, was Time Cop. And it's the old another idea to go back and save his wife who was murdered uh, uh, years ago and he gets to go back and try and save her. He's not supposed to, but he does. And uh, meanwhile, he finds out that it was the fact that they're actually coming back to kill him when she died all those years ago to keep him from stopping them from what yeah. they were doing. So it's, again, yeah, it's fun to play with time travel. I, I love it. I have other time travel stories that I want to do mess with your head, you know. 
Do you have a favorite comic book, not the ones that you've written or a favorite character? Yeah, I have a lot of them. I mean, I'm, I'm going to stick to Dark Horse books right now. Oh, well, yeah. Look, I, Matt Kent, uh, Jeff Lemire, Frank Miller, uh, Mike Mignola, um, Paul Chadwick. I mean, I, a lot of our artists, uh, Jeff Darrow, these are artists and writers that I've gone after because I did like their work in the first place. So if they're at Dark Horse, generally, uh, it's because I like what they're doing. So, uh, you know, we all have our favorites. Right now, I'm collecting Superman, as you can see back there in both, yes. both comics and... Uh, I'm trying to put a run of Superman together, the original one. So uh, I have to work for years to try and pay for it. You know. <laughs> so no, no, no plans to retire just yet until after your Superman oh, collection. No interest in retiring. None. Why? I'd go nuts. And not only that, my wife would throw me out if I, <laughs> I'm, I was not doing anything. You know, so. No, just I start your... projects. I, I wait for the time I th say, oh, if I can just get to the fifth then i've got a day off and then i on the fifth i'll start a new project so it's just so it is you're always on the move and never stopping your your create your creative process i just uh there's a lot to do got plenty of time to sleep right that final <laughs> that, that final sleep uh, i want to get as much done in before that comes as i can yeah I, i'm starting to feel that now that i've gone over 60 it's you know I've been over for a while, so uh, <laughs> just stay healthy. I work out every day, and uh, and uh, I keep writing. I, I'm starting to draw again a little bit. I want to. I've, I was asked to do a painting for one of the cherries out here, and I said, "Yeah, that'd be fun." And I had I haven't painted for years. I mean, not since I started Dark Horse. And painting used to be a big part of my life. I could have. Uh, Canvas is right in our in our apartment living room, and uh, just all all the spare time. So I thought, yeah, that'd be great. I'll go paint something. But then when I tried to paint, I realized, oh, I forgot about this and I forgot about that. And it was a mess. So finally, <laughs> and I had to have it in the next day. And I thought, geez, I can't do that because I was expecting just to do some quick something. Couldn't do it. I mean, I can still take a pencil and paper, but they wanted a painting. And uh, so I had my kids just do handprints all over it. And it was the only thing that didn't sell at the charity thing. So I learned my lesson. You can't, I, I uh, tried to, you know what, uh, pull a fast one on that one. Didn't work. It didn't work. Didn't um, work. When you did paintings when you were younger, were they also of science fiction and fantasy themes? Or was it more like? Yeah, a lot of things. I, I like, I was. When I was in art school, I was um, impressed by uh, Luca, if you know who he is, and his uh, Sarah Bernhardt paint, uh, drawings and paintings. Uh, Yugoslavian, I think he was Yugoslavian, but he, you've seen his stuff a million times if you saw his work. He always had the lady with the cigarette. Or, oh, okay. Uh, amazing, and he was huge at the time. Art Nouveau and Art Deco, both I was balancing both those two styles. And uh, so I like that. And, and you know, I, I was a Renaissance fan. I mean, I studied the Renaissance hard. I love Michelangelo. Um, I, I always thought, and I've seen other people say it, that's probably why it's in my head. Um, he would have been a comic. If you look at his art, you realize he would have been a comic book artist today <laughs> uh, with his pencils and his figures and his... Uh, um, idealized uh, poses and um, yeah. these days he would have just gravitated to the comic book business which is where the artists that do that you know, often go um, and I loved Frank Frazetta I, I don't know if he was he was the, yeah. the art god to a lot of us and I got to know Frank and work with Frank so that was very exciting been the best part of this that uh, a lot of the people I really admired I got to know Will Eisner who was was a hero um, and a role model for me because not only did he write and create comics uh, he also uh, owned the company that did it so we used to get in a lot of discussions about the business and his thoughts on it and what was really uh, exciting to me is he you know he always was always curious and always curious why 
I did things the way I did because he was always trying to learn. So even though he had so much more experience, he would ask me um, about uh, why I was doing this, what I thought about that, and just taking it all in. Uh, I got to, I was lucky enough, I got to have him and Harlan Ellison here for the Lake Oswego wow. Festival of the Arts. And uh, I got them both here. And we did uh, two shows uh, where we sat up on stage, the three of us, and talked. And um, they sold out, uh, both of them. And it was pretty amazing. They have the Harlan, <laughs> Harlan sat in the lobby of the uh, Art Center in Lake Oswego, and uh, or the Theatrical Center, um, I don't know what the official name is, but he sat in the lobby and wrote his next book on a typewriter for us while he was talking. <laughs> Do you remember what your first book was that you read that, that got you going down the science fiction fantasy road? Well, I could read before I went to school and uh, my mom had me reading early and my mom used to bring comics home and I had to know what was in it. I could look at the pictures, but I had to know, so uh, she'd buy me workbooks and sit with me, and I was I was a good reader when I went into first grade, and did an interview one time where they asked me uh, how I was in school, and I said I was generally bored, and they said I was probably pretty bored until I got to college, when I found out nobody's going to hold your hand if you didn't, if you didn't <laughs> look hard, they, they didn't care, so uh, right. that, was, that was my wake up schooling, but uh, before that I you know, I, I could get by without doing much study. I didn't have to work that hard. But first day of school, I uh, and I attribute that because um, I could read. I could always read. I read, read way ahead of my level. And uh, the uh, first day of school, I told them, they asked me, when did my boredom start? They said, the first day of school. I said, you know, <laughs> we went in, uh, we, we went to first the first day of class, first grade. And they passed out fun with Dick and Jane, and I read it while they passed it out. It took me three minutes to read the whole book. And then I had to sit in that class for however long, I don't remember how long, it seemed like eternity while everybody else was learning how to read it. So I, 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 when they asked me, well, when did your boredom start? I said, probably the first hour of the first day of my first minute of class. <laughs> so. Did you find yourself trying to draw capes onto Dick and Jane to make them into superheroes? No, but I used to draw all the time. I used to draw all kinds of things and certain superheroes run of things, space things. I did my own neighborhood uh, newspaper strip, comic strip, and I draw, uh, um, I get the, there's a paper called the Enterprise Courier that would wrap their paper in newsprint and it was wider than the Oregonian or the Eternal. So I'd go up and they'd wrap it. So when they cut the wires and took the papers, the uh, paper boy would leave the white paper. So I'd always go up and collect it. When I get enough of it, I'd draw a strip with my own creation characters and then I'd recopy it like three or four times, the same strip, trying to draw them exactly the same. Then I'd go sell them in the neighborhood up and down 35th Street. <laughs> uh, Mr. Hill, who was across the street from me, called me the J. Paul Getty of 35th Street. That was the nickname for me. Now, I can't remember, did you grow up in Milwaukee or? Uh huh. I came when I was, I just turned five, I believe. 1955. I could have been four turning five, yeah. So I had to wait a year to get to school and I was eager to get in. And uh, that's when uh, my mom had always worked with me uh, about reading, but she really, because I was so eager to get to school, she would buy me all these workbooks and we'd do them all the time. And, you know, they were pretty easy and we learned to read pretty fast. I remember I, I think it was when I was in third grade, I got a book the, because I had seen at the Victory. So I don't know if you remember, so the theater downtown used to be called the Victory Theater. Oh, it, that I don't. Up, yeah, a veteran of the war and he used to be there all the time. The guy that I can't remember his name, but I used to know it. But anyway, um, Every Christmas in downtown Milwaukee, they'd have free movies in the weeks on the weekends, the week before Christmas. And the reason was the parents could drop their kids off and uh, go to a movie while they went shopping. So the merchants uh -huh. would. So, yeah, so every year there was something. When I was in the third grade, I'm pretty sure um, 
they showed the seventh boy to Sinbad, which I sat in that movie and I thought, how did they know I would love this movie so much? <laughs> I on a whole drawing jag. And uh, I used to, uh, um, um, I became I, I became this crazy movie fan after this. Luckily, you know, I got to, uh, I, I was really very privileged and, and just uh, lucky to get to know, uh, uh, Ray Harryhausen, who created those movies, uh, Seven Voyages of Sinbad and Jason and the Argument, Ar 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 Argonauts, and uh, um, just all the movies I loved as a kid. And I got to know him and work with him later on. And he actually came to me at the San Diego Comic Con one time, and uh, he said, "Mike, I'm looking at all of the things you do at Dark Horse." He said, "Why? What's the reason?" And I said, you really want to know? And he said, yeah. And I said, Ray Harryhausen. Do Ray Harryhausen. So that's one of my favorite moments ever. Um, but anyway, I forgot what the question was. I did too, because, you know, senior moment. It's, and it probably wasn't important if I can't remember it. Well, it got me off on a, uh, off on a, good, a good memory. Ray was a great guy. You know, you meet... So when you're a generation or two behind some of these people that you so admire and you get to know them and uh, they pass away, you get to know them well and then they pass away. It's uh, you keep losing these, these heroes and these, these. Okay, you just went on Zoom. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, yeah, I, I got to meet Muhammad Ali, who is my all-time sports hero right no. now. Right now, I'm, I'm trying to get a, uh, some. I'm, I'm trying to get something going with Bill Russell, uh, my all-time basketball hero, uh, Ray Harryhausen, uh, Jack Kirby, uh, um, just so many of these great people that I grew up admiring that I've gotten to know because of comic books, basically. Yeah, so, and, and comic books are universal. I mean, pretty much everyone loves them. Either they admit it or they don't. Well, the rest of the world doesn't look at comic books quite the same as we do in America. In America, we look at them as this third-rate, uh, low-budget, uh, um, um, what, uh, literary junk, you know? But it's not true. I mean, comics for a long time have been very serious. I think probably in the early years, there was reason to think that, or the 40s, a lot of stuff just being cranked out. Right now, you know, serious writers, serious artists are in, and uh, are are writing serious pieces of work. And the the fact that it's it's uh, panel to panel and that it's uh, um, a combination of words and pictures does not make it any less legitimate than any other form of communication. In fact, I think in a lot of ways it makes it more personal and more powerful. I think that, uh, I mean, some of the books today, there's a lot of uh, biographical material in comics. Um, I think years ago, geez, I, Barefoot Jen, if you've ever read it, and some of those books, uh, Japanese book that uh, really touched me years ago. Uh, but uh, you can find every, all the adventure, everything, and you, um, you really go into a world when you're really engrossed in a comic or a graphic novel as they like to call them. I call them all comic books, but I have to differentiate. <laughs> uh, not, not for me. I, 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 I call them, I, I go home and I tell my wife I'm reading a graphic novel. She goes, you mean you're reading a comic? Yeah, I am. <laughs> That's what you know. It's, 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 it's the truth. Of it, you know? A mouse won a Pulitzer Prize, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm out of questions. Okay. I hope I gave you some interesting answers. Oh, you did. I think this is fantastic. I really appreciate everything you do for the community and everything you've done for the library. I mean, you, you guys oh, well, have been have fantastic. To, well, we have to do some more for the library, don't we? Yes, I think the librarians need to be paid more. So I'll if you want I, to drop a bag of cash off. Yeah, well, how about if I, uh, how if I prod our, our local decision makers? Yes, do that too. <laughs> I'll support the ones that support the libraries. How's that? That's, that's a good deal. That's, that's all I can ask. And uh, certainly I, we're happy to uh, put Dark Horse books over there. 
anytime. Oh, and I'm happy to buy them and bring them over. So, well, you know, I used to bring boxes over them years ago. Yeah. I sort of stopped doing it. I need to get, get back on the ball, you know? Right now we can't take donations, but when we can, oh, really? yeah. Because you're limited in space. Is that it? Oh, well, our friends, um, yeah, limited in space, limited in the ability to handle them and store them and take them out because our friends can't go through them and look through them. They're not, they're not coming into the building. So right now we're very limited. Oh. But you'll be the first people I contact. Well, I've got there. warehouses full of them, so they're not going. <laughs> I always loved it when the boxes, because then I start going through them and pulling them out and looking at them. And yeah. It gets well, there's, some important, there's some important book, uh, graphic novels that have come out, important work that's come out. So you're missing out on them. You know, we uh, we're doing the complete Dark Horse archive at Portland State Library, Ooh. Portland State University, and they're archiving the complete uh, Dark Horse. And it turns out that it's uh, uh, one of the most visited places in the library is the section that they have our books. It's a huge success. Do you think they'll digitalize it? Well, we're already digitalized. I don't know, uh, you know, there's a, it, it's a different, on some books, I'm sure we will offer that, you know, uh, but are you saying, will they digitalize it for? Their collection, yeah. Posterity? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope so. I mean, we already have it digitalized, so we have that. Oh, you have it. everything digitalized for Dark Horse? Yeah, well, we do. All our books are digital now, too. That's true. We have the Dark Horse Digital. You should take a look. You can get the, I'll give you a passcode. You can see the complete Dark Horse library. Wow. So you, got, you even went back into the catalog and got the things before. Yeah, we've gone back. We haven't gotten everything 100%, but we've gone back for a lot of our books, yeah. If you if it sees print, whether it's new or old, it's been digitized. And I'm gonna I'll check out that library as soon as I'm done here. Right. Um, thank you very much again. Okay. And uh, have. Pardon. I said have a good evening. I'm going to I'm going to go watch the Yankees, and I'm hoping that they will uh, win another game. Okay, I that's a bad note to go on, but we'll we'll just leave it there. <laughs> oh, you know, I have to say that I have a whole uh, room of Yankee stuff, and I fly to New York for Yankee <sighs> games. So I just want you to know that. So uh, thank you, thank you for the pain. It it hurts <laughs> right here. <laughs> okay. Have okay, a good great evening. Great to talk with you. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs>